Coming up, the mysteries of history get uncovered in both fiction and nonfiction books. Recollections of attending boarding school, the struggles of family and land to the archeological thefts made in the Southwest. We hear from authors and learn more about their work. Stay tuned for those interviews plus headlines ahead on the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands on the web at iltf.org. Support for the ICT newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. The sun is shining on two tribal colleges with an investment in solar. The Department of Energy announced Thursday that $3 million will go to the Blackfeet Community College in Montana and Turtle Mountain Community College in North Dakota. It's part of the Biden-Harris administration's efforts to reduce energy costs for disadvantaged communities. It aims to increase energy security and resilience on college campuses in support of tribal sovereignty. Over the last 12 years, the Energy Department, Indian Energy, has supported 210 tribal projects in 49 states. The $215 million investment is leveraged with over $93 million through cost share. From the city to the res, a coming-of-age dramedy is making waves. Fry Bread Face and Me follows two adolescent Navajo cousins from different worlds as they bond during a summer on their grandmother's ranch. Billy Luther, who is Navajo, Hopi, and Laguna Pueblo, wrote and directed the film as it drew from his experiences growing up. The film is streaming on Netflix and was released in select theaters on Native American Heritage Day. Fry Bread Face and Me is currently writing on the Netflix Top 10 and has a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Through the work of organizations like the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, the stories of boarding school trauma and reconciliation have been featured many times here on the ICT newscast. Well, ICT Shirley Snavy brings us a new perspective, and that is from her mother. She spoke with Virginia Driving Hawk Snavy, who is a longtime author, about her own boarding school experience. Let's watch. My mother is an author of several books, fiction and nonfiction. In 1933, Virginia Driving Hawk was born on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. We sat down this summer to talk about her youth. She attended boarding school during the World War II era. At St. Mary's, that was when during World War II, when we had teachers that were coming from, um, mainly from New England places. And um, we had this uh, Japanese teacher that came to be with us. And I didn't think much of, about her. I mean, she didn't look much differently <laughs> than the Indian students we had. And she was, uh, and I didn't have her for a class because I think she didn't taught uh, the advanced English classes and I wasn't ready for that yet. But uh, we had an all school assembly and she was explaining about how she came to be at St. Mary's. Her family were in California and she had gone to school in in the East, and I don't remember the college where it was, but she had been sponsored uh, by um, an Episcopal congregation. And then uh, after her parents were injured, they were taken from their homes and placed in these camps in Nevada and uh, because they were worried about them being espionage and spies that close to Japan. The congregation in the East did not want her going back to those internment camps. So some pulled some strings some way or other and said that they would uh, be responsible for her. And so they managed to find her this teaching position 
in the interior of the United States where things would be all safe for her and no spies, that sort of thing. And I remember being so appalled about how can we treat people like that, just take them away from their homes and then move them to strange places, and she wouldn't be able to go home. And I expressed that to her. I said, oh, that's just terrible that you had to be treated like that. And she looked at me and she said, what do you think reservations are? And of course, I suppose I was about 12 years old and something like that never even occurred to me what it was. And it's kind of sparked my curiosity so that I became more aware of what my tribal life had been like and sparked my curiosity to explore that later as I got older and became a writer. Tell us about your education and how you grew up and, and where you went to school. I liked school very much. It was fun to be around other kids. And then we moved to Oak Creek, South Dakota, and I was in the third grade then and started school there. And I was very fortunate to have a teacher that uh, appreciated that I learned to read very quickly, and I loved to read. And he would give me books from his private library and everything, and I just assumed everybody had books like that. I didn't realize that. And then um, after the third grade, I stayed in Oak Creek until I was ready for the sixth grade. And then my parents decided I should go to boarding school. And this was usually what happened to children on the reservation. If they wanted more education, they had to go to a boarding school. Well, my parents decided that the Rosebud Boarding School, that's where they went. And they had some unfortunate experiences there in not being able to speak the language and other things. And uh, they didn't want, they didn't think I would get the education that I should have. So they sent me to St. Mary's School for Indian Girls, which is at Springfield, South Dakota. And I went there when I was in the sixth grade and stayed until I graduated from high school. And um, it was a school uh, that later became considered a prep school because we were being prepared for further education, whether it be college or to, to do something uh, in some sort of an occupation that would require further training. What was your experience like at boarding school? I was very homesick. The first, I don't know, seemed like forever. And, uh, and we slept in dormitories. I was used to having my own bed and sort of privacy. And um, but the one thing that was running water <laughs> and toilets, we didn't have to go outside like we did at home. So that was a plus. But I was very homesick and I was very lonely and shy. And, and uh, then the school had a system that they called Big Sisters. So an older student would be assigned to a newer, younger student and would help them and, you know, get through the maze of what was expected of you and the chores you had to do and making your bed and and all of these different things, which did help because somebody was keeping an eye on you. So, and then uh, when the classes started, that was, that was fine because I really liked school, enjoyed that. When we're talking about all the abuse of boarding schools, how, how about your, your relatives? Did, did anybody? Well, my, my parents, that generation, are the ones that experience that kind of trauma or might have. Uh, my dad I did not speak English when he started school, and so they were forbidden to use the language when they in the classroom, and, they, and it was a very difficult way to start to learn. And um, he and a friend of his, uh, Noah Broken Leg, uh, would sneak out and go hide behind the barn so they could talk Lakota to each other and kind of explain to, to understand what was going on at the school. They never f experienced um, any physical abuse, um, but they saw friends of theirs that did who uh, were often supposedly got into trouble for some reason or other, and then they would be physically beaten that, but they never were the my dad said, we were good boys. My mother, on the other hand, went there, but she did not speak Lakota fluently. It was not her first language because her family had English. 
And so she had the experience of uh, being teased by the other students as trying to be a white person because she wouldn't speak uh, Lakota. In your career, you became an educator. You know, we didn't have much choices. At least I didn't realize that at the time. If you wanted to go on to do something after high school, it was either being a teacher or a nurse. Well, I had no desire to be around sick people or whatever. And so it was that was all that was left for me to do was be a teacher. And I got to many years later after I found out that there were such things as women who were lawyers, I thought, you know, I could have been a lawyer. I like to read, not necessarily a tri lawyer, but something like that. And I always kind of regretted that I never had that opportunity to, to look at that. And I, not many of us did at that age, at least Indian girls. With my mother, Virginia Driving Hawks Navy, and the Black Hills, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. A 50-year-old mystery converges with a present-day struggle over family, land, and history. It's the plot of a new novel from an Ojibwe author. A song over Misqua Rapids is from Boyfort citizen Linda Lagarde Grover. ICT Shirley Snavy has this interview. It's my fourth fiction book, and they um, they most they center around a fictional reservation and band in northern Minnesota. It's fictional, but it's very much like um, it's very much like the the lands that my family's from, Boys Fort, and also Grand Portage and Fond du Lac. So it's like that, but it's fiction. Sure, it is. <laughs> I mean, you must have modeled. <laughs> model the characters on some folks you know or stories you heard <laughs> you know David Troyer has a book that I that I admire it's um, a novel called Prudence and so somebody was asking him too because it's set in Walker Minnesota and so they're saying you know where you know what what part here is is really happened and stuff and he said I made it all up <laughs> birds have a lot of symbolism in all native cultures right and mm -hmm. uh, for you guys, uh, Migazi um, is one of those, but the robin seems to be the messenger in your book. Tell me about the robin. The robin um, takes care of stories, of old stories, and so communicates them to the, you know, to their, um, to other robins, and that is their kind of their sacred trust here. And so they they keep the stories. They care for them. They observe what's going on. And so that adds to the story. And then it passes on to another generation. And so, yeah, they, uh, they're they kind of a, um, they're not as noticeable, I guess, a bird, but they, um, but they do know the stories. And the, the female robins, actually, I, I read, um, I read quite a bit about older women in, in this book. And, you know, female robins, as it is in everywhere in the bird and animal world, are not as, um, not as um, colorful and splashy as the, as the males. At the same time, they are, um, they are the under pennings of, of existence here and just as you know female humans are there's a lot of humor in the book um and the uh the interplay between mm, those who are in this world and those who have passed on i think is just a delightful read i don't want to give too much away but um the way the aunties come together with their lawn chairs i think is just charming <laughs> well you know my aunt um and she's, you know, she's she's in the next world herself now and has been for quite a while. But she used to um, she used to talk in that way. And so I I enjoyed, you know, having having those ladies come to the book here. And and I remember she um, she used to say that, um, you know, on the fourth day, the after after someone dies the spirit arrives in the in the next destination but she said yet at the same time they are still among us all the time so it's just you know it's a it's a it's a leap of faith and something that i think is pretty uh a pretty easy leap for for native people in the way that we the way that we um, see the world and have the world shown to us. And so I had her in mind when um, when the ladies made their appearance here in this book. But to me, the 
the story, the the land itself is is the not just the backdrop, but actually the the large entity in the story is you know the people in northeastern Minnesota living living on that land and great changes taking place in their community. And yet the terrain, though we may change the terrain, and there is you know there's something in um in my newest book about changes to, to the terrain and and human human made inroads on things that you just go, well, is that really a good thing? But at the same time, I, I I think that the the land itself, the terrain around us, I mean, not just the earth, I mean, the water, everything is so much larger and more powerful than we are and are um, and have as their what breathes life into them is, you know, is is the the creator, great spirit. And so we are really kind of frail and futile as we do things just the same. This is what we have now. We have our we have our and. You know, we are, I think we're fortunate, you know, that we, that we have still have reservation lands. I mean, we, I, I mean, those of us who are not obliterated, you know, we are thankful for this every day. And at the same time, I think that traditionally we have felt, you know, just as the Robin is about the stories, you know, our, our task has been to appreciate and to, to care for what we have been given, which is, which is the, you know, the, the mother earth that we walk upon. And so that's a big part of this story. And in all my books, then what what is happening up there? And a, um, a treaty happened. People early in earlier books, people people had to relocate to move there. And then um, the characters in the books experience the things that that all of us have. I mean, the the boarding school, you know, the education policies, the the fed, uh, the um, termination policies of the fifties through the late 80s, um, all the programs associated with these things. And then of course the 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 larger degree of tribal sovereignty and self-determination. And is and I want to show that it's not a perfect world and we are not perfect beings in it either. Um, we we still must deal with deal with things in the contemporary world and and it can be a struggle sometimes you know um how do we maintain what we really have been taught is is our is our duty to continue in a world that changes so much sins of the shovel looting murder and the evolution of american archaeology is a new book written by archaeologist rachel morgan from reckless looting to professional science, the book explores the history of early American archaeology. ICT's Paris Wise spoke with Morgan on this history, as well as the perspective of modern day archaeology. Thanks for having me. Sons of the Shovel uh, follows uh, the trajectory of a uh, expedition, um, an archaeological expedition from the late 19th century and how that expedition got itself into quite a bit of trouble and caused some controversy and paralleled some major shifts in archaeology as a discipline. This story starts out with um, a family of ranchers who were based in Colorado, just outside of Mesa Verde. And in uh, the late 19th century, they stumbled across a, uh, a place that many people know today as Cliff Palace. Um, they believed that they were, um, you know, the first people to see it. We know that they weren't at this time, but it was a big moment for them. They became very um, interested in the past and um, the past became a source of profit for them and their family. How did you go about doing your research for this book? Um, so I uh, sifted through a lot of old um field books and um, diaries from archaeologists um, from uh, the 19th century and try to fuse that with um, current uh, archaeological literature on uh, the period. How did you go about getting an Indigenous perspective in this book? Um, indigenous people have always been foundational to American archaeology, but they have not been treated that way. Um, and so I drew on the work of a lot of uh, indigenous archaeologists. Um, we are fortunate that times have changed. And so their 
is a lot of uh, resources out there uh, that uh, give us new perspectives on these sites. Whereas in the past, we were looking at these sites where often indigenous uh, labor was used or indigenous peoples were relied on as informants, but they were not credited um, for their work and they were not um, treated as equal members or as collaborators in this process. And so fortunately that has changed. And so there were a lot of uh, resources from um, indigenous archeologists here practicing today that I was able to draw from. I'm curious because you said you were able to read some of the journal entries directly from these people. Can you talk more on that? Sure. Um, they are really uh, interesting uh, documents. Um, sometimes these archaeologists are writing very clinical notes that say something, you know, like, we found five pieces of pottery today. And other times they're getting uh, a little more personal with things and, you know, saying, I am so tired of working with this person. I could do their job so much better than them. Um, so it, um, it varies a lot. And uh, there's a lot of character in those documents uh, that made it really exciting to work with. And so in those journal entries that you were reading, were there ever any accounts of interactions with the indigenous communities? Um, yes, there were a lot of um, Navajo men who came to work on these um, excavations in Chaco Canyon in particular. And um, so there were accounts of what they were finding, um, how they were spending their time when they weren't working. Um, they are um, sort of very limited um, descriptions, but I think that they're important because they are a source of credit that was not given in the past, but these people were the means of making this excavation possible and their names aren't listed in the reports um, that came out of these uh, uh, projects. And so these diary entries are a unique resource to credit people who did not get their fair due in the past. Considering how many items in museums were obtained in questionable ways, um, how are ethics covered and discussed in archaeology? So today, um, ethics and archaeology, um, we stress that collaboration is the um, most important way forward, collaboration with all affected communities. Um, and that is very important when we talk about the objects and the individuals that have made their way into museums and agencies and universities. And so it, one of the major concepts that we talk about in ethics and archeology span is the concept of repatriation and working with affected communities to make sure that that process is done efficiently and respectfully. Yeah, what can you touch more on um, in terms of institutions that are still holding on to remains and culturally significant items of tribes, especially with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act in place? So the NACPRA process um, is not as speedy as many people would like it to be. And so there are still um, many ancestral individuals and sacred objects that remain in university repositories and museum repositories and in the repositories of federal agencies. Um, I think there is a push for that process to be sped up so that um, those individuals and objects that remain uh, in those places are returned to the communities that um, have been waiting for them to come home for a long time. Um, it is often, um, there are multiple reasons why that process is not as efficient as people would like to um, see it. Um, it can be, uh, uh, based on uh, resources of the entities that are still holding these um, people and these objects. And um, so I think there's a lot of discussion around um, increasing the resources so that these people and these objects can get home where they belong. Since the evolution of archaeology is in the title, what developments or progress have you been seeing in archaeology in terms of framing of accountability and authority when it comes to returning these items, do you see it changing a lot? I think archaeology has matured a lot and is very aware that in the past it was not the discipline that it would like to be. Um, and I think that um, making amends for some of the things that were done incorrectly in the past is a big part of modern archaeology. And so I think that we have seen a lot of progress in 
Um, I think that you see that shift in making sure that collaboration is a huge part of the discipline moving forward and that the um, wishes of communities impacted by archaeology are heard and respected and that uh, things that should not be in museum repositories or universities or federal agencies are returned to the communities and homes that they belong to. What do you hope people take away from your book? I really hope that people see that um, archaeology in the past um, had some pretty big issues and that the evolution of archaeology was something that was important and needed to happen and that we're very lucky today to have the historic preservation legislation that we do and that we should uh, work hard to make sure that we continue to have those protections for the past. Rachel Morgan, author of Sins of the Shovel, Looting, Murder, and the Evolution of American Archaeology. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Paris. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.